Um, and thank, thanks for inviting me to speak at the Myland Institute. Um, I'm off to Edinburgh again on Wednesday, so uh, I haven't been allowed to escape the, uh, the tour around the devolved administrations <coughs> yet. It's all part of the, the new politics. And what, what I thought was fascinating about um, the programme that you had today was the way in which the Institute was trying to bring together historians and political scientists together with policymakers to actually get some cross fertilization between different perceptions and understandings of uh, recent history. And, and this, you know, I, my, my view, and this is certainly true of any. Um, effort to understand European policy is you need a mixture of, sort of history, factual analysis, but also some feeling for political mythology um, if you're going to get a grip on um, what is happening in Europe debates, not just in this country, but around the continent. I want to focus my remarks today on three areas, why we're holding a referendum on our membership of the EU, and then to say something about the government's reform priorities, and then a bit about what is actually happening in the renegotiation. So let's start with why the government is actually holding a referendum at all. And the answer, at one level, is straightforward, because the British public have made it clear they're not happy with the status quo, and this government was elected with a very clear uh, policy platform of giving the British people an in-out referendum by the end of 2017. I think when you probe into the reasons for public dissatisfaction, one thing that comes up again and again, certainly on the doorstep, so anecdotally, but I think it's also borne out by more scientific opinion research, is that people feel that they've been denied a say on our relationship with the EU since that first referendum back in 1975. And over the last 40 years, there's no doubt whatever view anyone here takes about the pros and cons of British membership, that the nature of the European Union has changed quite profoundly. Um, we've seen the creation of a single market, um, which, um, now let's not forget, the Single European Act resulted in the biggest single extension of qualified majority voting in the EU's history. We've seen the very significant enlargement of the European Union to embed democracy, free markets, and the rule of law in Central Europe. Um, but we've also seen the creation of a single currency that has introduced a dynamic towards closer economic and, to some extent, political integration as well. And we have had, since the 1975 referendum, the treaties of Maastricht, Amsterdam, Nice, Lisbon. Uh, and those have shifted competences towards the European legislative and decision-taking process. And I think that the fact, when I look back, that all those decisions were taken without consulting the public formally did allow resentment to accumulate, most particularly at the time of the Lisbon Treaty when people looked at our next door neighbours in Ireland and saw that they were having not just one referendum but two on the subject. Um, and that sense of frustration in, in the public mood, I think, was um, also born out of what you described, Alan, as, as, as a shift in the last... 15 to 20 years towards making referendums more a part of the way in which we do <coughs> politics in this country. It's starting with the Scottish and Welsh referendums back in 1998, but then the Northern Ireland peace process, the, the Greater London mayoralty, whether to have an assembly for North East England, whether to change the voting system for the House of Commons, Scottish independence, you know, all of those went to a referendum. And I think that in this age of digital technology that makes possible you know, the idea of a, a virtual agora uh, for voters, um, there is a greater expectation now than in 1975 or in the years before that big constitutional and political decisions should be subjected to some kind of um, direct democratic test. 
So let me turn to the reforms that the government is seeking as part of our renegotiation. And as the Prime Minister said, these fall into four broad categories. And I want to start with uh, the economic side. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Europe faces an existential challenge in terms of competitiveness. We are still seeing European countries struggle to recover from the crash of 2008. We see terrifyingly high levels of unemployment and particularly youth unemployment in many European countries, particularly in such countries as uh, Spain, Greece, Italy and France. We're seeing the United States stretch its lead in competitiveness over the European Union, measured in terms of things like rate of new business formation or success in getting venture capital into SMEs. And these challenges will be enough on their own. But we're having to confront these as a continent at the same time as we are facing an historic shift of global economic power to Asia and Latin America, and, and despite the current slowdown in the emerging economies, I, I'm absolutely certain that that is going to be you know, the big economic story, one of the big economic stories of this century, with African countries part of this process in the next 20 years. And a further uh, change through the impact of digital technology, which is now starting to shake up our accustomed ways of doing white collar and professional work, in the way that automation shook up factory floor production working a generation ago. And you know, academics here will know now that you, know, you, can, you can use computer programs to test for things like plagiarism in uh, examination <coughs> papers. You know, the, the use of computers and programming to do things that people have been used to doing till now is something that is going to develop far further and faster. Over the next 15 years, Europe's share of global output is forecast to halve. And I think that the truth is, whichever country you look at, unless Europe raises its competitiveness, the next generation of Europeans will bluntly not be able to afford the standards of living or the social protection or the public services that people take for granted these days. And if that is the future, then the sort of shift towards populist or extremist movements of both left and right that we've seen in so many different European countries is a trend that will be reinforced rather than one that we will see diminished in the years to come. So competitiveness and economic reform are in the interests of Europe as a whole, including but not only the United Kingdom. So we need to sign new trade deals, cut regulation and complete the single market. The single market we have is working pretty well in terms of trade in goods, but is woefully underdeveloped when it comes to services and digital, despite the fact that it is those sectors of our economies that are going to be the chief drivers of new jobs uh, uh, and new growth in the years to come. Uh, we need to uh, therefore welcome the Commission's new internal market strategy, uh, the, the work that they're starting to take forward on digital and on services liberalisation. Welcome to the 80% reduction in new legislative proposals under the Juncker Commission, something that will go uh, a fair way towards our objective of securing a cut in unnecessary, overcomplicated, overburdensome red tape that holds back European businesses. But we need to go further. We need to turbocharge this agenda. It can't be right that while some 40% of people in the EU bought something online last year, fewer than 10% of transactions crossed the national frontier. And when you simply cannot get access to services like Spotify or even BBC iPlayer everywhere within the European Union. Same is true of trade. There's been progress already. The free trade deal that the EU complete, completed with South Korea in 2010 is estimated already to benefit the British economy by £500 million a year. And we're moving ahead too with trade deals with Singapore, Canada, Japan 
and the United States. And I am in the camp of those who think that TTIP is a potential game changer. In effect, it is about setting global regulatory standards on a transatlantic basis rather than waiting for the Pacific countries to stitch up some sort of deal in a few years' time, leaving Europe in the rather humiliating position of having then to copy what others have decided. But pro so progress is being made on economic reform, but more needs to be done, and there needs to be a clear sense of common urgency across Europe in attaining those goals. Second, on economic governance, we need to fix the relationship between those member states who are in the Eurozone and those who are outside, so it works better for everyone. And, and I think this is perhaps the key strategic challenge for the EU and for its, its own institutions. For as far ahead as I can see, there are going to be some member states who've committed themselves to that currency union, who are in the euro, and other member states, and by no means just the UK, that will be outside that currency union. Those in the euro will want, indeed, I believe, will need to integrate their fiscal and economic arrangements more closely. And that will, in turn, uh, stimulate a need for a measure of political integration in order to find a way in which to hold such Eurogroup fiscal and economic decisions democratically accountable. And there are various ideas already doing the rounds in European think tanks about how that could be done, special chambers of the European Parliament, assemblies of national and European parliamentarians from the Euro countries and, and so on. And the question is, where does that then leave a country like the UK and others that will be outside the currency union, either permanently or at least for some years, but which want to play an active and full role in the EU across the range of decision taking? And most of you here will have heard George Osborne last week set out the stall in his speech in Berlin. There is a deal to be done here. It's clear to us that the institutional framework of the euro needs to be strengthened and there have been steps forward like banking union and the single resolution mechanism. But very few believe that further changes to the treaties are avoidable if we're going to have a successful and sustainable euro. And the British government's position is that rather than stand in the way of those changes, we in Britain will be willing to support them as long as we can agree a way in which to safeguard the interests of those of us who are outside the Eurozone. And we see that as being accomplished by embedding in European law a number of binding principles. A recognition that the EU has more than one currency and that there should be no discrimination on the basis of currency. Understanding that Eurozone integration should be done in a way that doesn't damage the interests of non-Euro members. So, for example, decisions that affect all 28 member states need to be taken with all 28 in the room. Agreement that participation by non-Euro members in developments like banking union should be voluntary and not compulsory. And a guarantee that taxpayers in countries not in the Euro won't bear the costs of supporting countries that are in the Eurozone. Now, I know that there's some critics of the government's approach who say that these, the risks to the, the UK are purely theoretical. No, it's certainly true that Eurozone members do not always think alike. I don't often see Greek and Dutch ministers hastening to agree with each other in a council of ministers simply because they happen to share the same currency. And, you know, often they, ministers from different Eurozone countries vehemently disagree. <coughs> but the reality is also that the Eurozone countries now have a built-in qualified majority in the Council if they choose to act as a bloc. And we've had some examples. We had in July this year a sudden decision by the Eurozone in the heat of the Greek crisis to to consider using the European financial stability mechanism to bail out Greece in a way that would have made the UK 
and other non-Eurozone members partially liable for any losses. And this was not only wrong when discussion was at a meeting where we were not present, but it was in breach of an agreement that the whole 28 had signed up to in 2010. Now, in this case, after some rather urgent work across Whitehall, we managed to ensure that British taxpayers' money was not on the line. But we don't want to have a situation in which we're fighting running battles on these issues, meeting by meeting, dossier by death dossier. The right approach is surely to sit down with our partners in a grown-up fashion and have a discussion about getting right the design for Europe on the basis of agreed principles together with a simple mechanism to ensure that those principles can be enforced. Third set of issues on sovereignty and subsidiarity. In some, uh, to some degree, this, this actually <coughs> derives from the difference between those who are in the single currency with all that means in terms of an integrationist dynamic and those who are outside. Because if you're in that currency union and you're committed to that process of further integration, then being part of an ever closer union is something that um, might well appeal. That you know, is a choice that European countries are perfectly entitled to take. But I think we're very clear in the UK that Britain does not wish to be part of an ever closer union in terms of a of greater political integration. And that's down, in my view, very much to differences in historical experience. For most of Europe, the mid-20th century was a time when national institutions and national identities were tested and failed. For many, the experience was one of horror, of uh, dictatorship, invasion, ethnic tension, political extremism. And then in 1945, millions of displaced people around the continent bombed out cities, people literally scrabbling in the rubble to find enough to eat. And it's not surprising, given that experience, that many people around Europe instinctively looked then and look today to integration as a way of stopping that ever happening to them again. But of course the British experience in that very same period of history was very different indeed. Our national identities and national institutions during that time were tested and were vindicated, were seen as what had enabled us to survive the onslaught of Nazism. And I think that Europe today needs to reflect that diversity of historical experience and contemporary political identity in its approach to the concept of ever closer union. A welcome step forward was made there in the June 2014 European Council conclusions, which acknowledged that for different member states, ever closer union should be interpreted in different ways. But I think we need to take those conclusions and build further upon them. We want, too, to see a greater role for national parliaments in the EU. The existing arrangements in the Lisbon Treaty that provide for yellow cards for national parliaments as a college to seek uh, a review of a commission initiative uh, should be strengthened further. Now, this does not mean unilateral vetoes. I, I wouldn't be happy with a system in which the most protectionist parliament in Europe could single-handedly veto every single market measure at will. Rather, what we want is a development of that Lisbon Treaty system under which national parliaments acting together can require a check in the European legislative process. And there's some very good creative ideas from the Dutch and Danish parliaments about ways in which that can be done. And fourth issue on migration and welfare. The truth is that EU freedom of movement rules were not designed to cope with population movements on the scale we've been experiencing over the last few years. In the last five years, the population of this country has grown by 2.3 million people, and we will have seen the demographic forecasts published last week 
uh, predicting uh, an increase in UK population to more than se well over 70 million by 2050, with us overtaking Germany uh, sometime in the 2040s, a development that will make for an interesting negotiation about voting weights in the Council of Ministers and representation in the European Parliament. Um, now, we're not questioning the principle of the free movement of workers, and we're not proposing quotas or caps. But what I am clear about is that if the British people are going to be persuaded to support continued membership, there'll need to be a recognition that the public concern about the pull factors associated with welfare and migration have been taken into account and have been reflected in agreed reforms. And George said last week in Berlin that if freedom of movement is to be sustainable, then our publics must see it as freedom to move to work rather than freedom to choose the most generous benefits. Finally, Alan, I just want to say a brief word about the process underway to try to secure these reforms. And whilst I always hesitate to disappoint an audience, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to <laughs> sort of give uh, an exclusive preview of what is going to be in the letter to Donald Tusk tomorrow or the Prime Minister's speech tomorrow. There'll be a statement in the House of Commons um, uh, where everything will be made plain. Um, the PM's already met the leaders of all the other 27 member states, together with the presidents of the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the European Council to talk through in detail with them, sometimes in, on a one-to-one -one basis, the reforms that we have been seeking. Uh, since the renegotiation process was formally launched at the June European Council, senior officials from the British side and from the Council, the Commission, and the legal services of the institutions have sat down in what are called technical talks to discuss on a without prejudice basis the legal and procedural vehicle that would be needed were a particular political outcome agreed by leaders. So the idea is there that we end up with a map uh, understood and agreed by both the UK and the Brussels institutions as to what would need to be done, whether it was treaty changes or protocols or secondary legislation or political declaration or whatever, to deliver a given political outcome if the leaders sign up to that. The last thing that we need to have is a European Council meeting where the heads of state and government are suddenly presented with a paper asking them you know, whether they think that a uh, 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 an amendment to you know, Article 146, subsection A, little g of the treaty, it, it needs to be amended in order to deliver something. That groundwork needs to be sorted out in advance so that the leaders, when they talk the politics, know that whatever they agree, the officials will then produce promptly uh, the, the legal, institutional, and procedural mechanism to deliver that agreed outcome. Tomorrow, as you know, the Prime Minister will be writing to Donald Tusk to set out the changes we want to achieve. And that will kickstart a more accelerated process of negotiation um, that will involve um, more bilateral discussions between us and all the other member states and the institutions, but also work led by Donald Tusk and his team in, in, in trying to coordinate the way uh, forward. Uh, we would hope that that might culminate in a deal even as early as the December European Council, though it is too early for me to be able to say you know, for certain that will, will happen. You know, the new Polish government only uh, gets sworn in on Wednesday. The, the Spanish um, have a general election on the 20th of December. So you know, there are no guarantees about the exact timing. But you know, now well, we, we, we've launched this process. You know, we want to, to, uh, to get on with the serious talks. And in parallel with this, the European Union referendum bill has gone through the House of Commons and is making its way through the House of Lords. Um, I've always said that in terms of a referendum timing, um, it depends on those two moving parts, when the legislation gets to the statute book and when the European Union level negotiations 
conclude. And as far as the PM is concerned, it is the substance that comes first. You know, he doesn't want to hold up uh, the discussions and agreement any longer than necessary, but what he's not going to do is to uh, cut a deal with which he is not satisfied for the sake of a particular arbitrary deadline. Um, you know, it'll be the substance that will determine the timing. But once the bill is law, then as soon as the, um, the uh, negotiations are over, um, <coughs> it's possible for the government to set a date. And, and you're, you're looking at a few months between a date being announced and the referendum taking place. We have to take secondary legislation through both Houses of Parliament, and we have to allow a minimum of 10 weeks uh, for the official campaigning period. So you know, you've seen all the speculation in the press about uh, particular dates. It all depends on these, uh, these moving parts, the negotiation and the legislation, and then making allowance for those four months, five months, between announcing the date and the referendum happening. Now let me, let me finish on, on this point. It was on this very day, 26 years ago, that the Berlin Wall came down. There was something um, almost sort of poetic in uh, Gunter Schabowski's death uh, uh, the other day, the man who's uh, uh, mistaken um, sort of announcement on behalf of the GDR sent those crowds over to the wall in uh, 19, um, 1989. And that event completely changed the world. And I, I still remember I was, I was a young political advisor who just moved to, from the Home Office to the Foreign Office with Douglas Hurd at that time. And it was just a, a quite unbelievable incredibly exciting and joyful is not too strong a word period of history a new Europe and a better Europe and I think that it is true that the way in which East Germany and the Central European countries were brought into the European Union through all the painstaking detailed processes of accession has enabled the rule of law and democratic institutions to be entrenched in those countries in a way that did not happen when the new democracies were created in the aftermath of World War I. But 26 years on, we also need to look forward and not only back. The European Union has achieved much. Together with NATO, it has secured peace after World War II provided a framework for Western Europe's post-war prosperity, and brought the nations of Southern and then of Central and Eastern Europe into the democratic fold. Now the challenge is to make that European Union more competitive, more democratic, and more flexible and accommodating of its diversity, so that it is ready for the next quarter of a century, for the benefit of the European Union, for the benefit, yes, of the United Kingdom as well, and that is what the government in its negotiation is seeking to do. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you very much, David. That was excellent. And um, I certainly remember where I was as well when the, the wall came down. I didn't know it was 26 years today, although I think it, I do remember it was. Um, we've got about 10, 15 minutes for questions. I'll, I'll take some time. Can I just use the program to just ask one question from there? Uh, chair, and just tell me, I was listening to what you said quite closely, and you weren't coming down one side or the other about whether or not it'd be the, the changes you're looking for would require treaty change. But mm -hmm. tell me, does the government have a dilemma in that if they are to get substantial enough changes to convince uh, the population and some of the skeptics that they've done enough, they would require treaty change, and therefore the danger would be could you get that through the 28 members of the union? If they don't go that far, the risk is that you'll have uh, people from the uh, no campaign saying you simply haven't gone far enough and it's just cosmetic changes that you're putting forward. Uh, the, we, we think that not everything that we are seeking will need treaty changes, um, but that some elements will. Um, what is also true is that the, um, 
timetable we've set for the referendum the, uh, by the end of 2017 means it is not practical to think of a treaty, new treaty being ratified by all 27 member states you know, within that period of time. So we would be looking at ways in which to make, in that context, the ways in which to make commitments to a future treaty change um, to be clearly seen as, as legally binding and irreversible. And there are various, there are various mechanisms you that are being explored in the yeah, course yeah. Of, the, of the technical talks that uh, have taken us further towards understanding what some of those outcomes might be. Okay, who would like to take some? Of course, we've got lots. Let's just take those three on that side there, and then we'll come back to the other ones. There's three in a row there. You, you, sorry. Yep. you started off by talking about the growing appetite for referendums in British politics, and I wondered, given that, whether you think that we need to evolve a clearer set of constitutional rules <laughs> about when we do and don't hold referenda, as many other countries do. Because a cynic might suggest that in 1975 and in 2011, and in the approaching referendum, it owed more to issues of party management than the higher constitutional principle. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. Ben Wright from the BBC. Mr. Livingston, would, would anything less than a four-year restriction on in-work benefits for EU migrants uh, be a failure in this renegotiation? Is that still your aim? And why are you finding so much resistance as you go about trying to secure this? And it doesn't sound to me that you're ever going to be comfortable being part of a government campaigning to leave the European Union. Could you imagine any circumstances where you would campaign to do that? And thirdly, and then we'll take some answers. Although pro-European, uh, Minister, I suggest that in identifying issues, you've tended to lose the wood for the trees. You've not referred to the significant Eurosceptic uh, element in your own Conservative Party, or to four million votes at the last election, yielding just one UK Independence Party MP, as contrasted with a much smaller uh, number of votes yielding 56 Scottish nationalists. I furthermore listened on the BBC Parliament channel to the Chancellor's Berlin speech, found it muddled, sycophantic to the extent that it made me cringe, and overly simplistic because it implied that all was sweetness and light between the UK and Germany, a country which, since you yourself have referred to the Second World War, we were at, um, at war with some 70 years ago. Please, would you comment? Not sure the final one, what the question was, but you can yeah, answer I, in all three how you see fit. Yeah, sure. Um, on the uh, interesting point about um, referendums, um, I don't think that there is an agreed government position in answer to your question. I mean, just to, if I just, you know, take the risk of speaking <coughs> personally on this, I, I, mean, I don't have a fixed view, but it, seems, it, it does seem to me that this is a question that all mature democracies are going to have to confront because you know, technology makes it possible for the first time in human history to have, if you wanted to, direct democracy uh, with a mass electorate. Um, and that does raise the sorts of questions that, that, that you posed to me. Um, and I, 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 don't ha I don't have a neat, easy answer to it at the moment. Uh, I don't think there's been appetite amongst the electorate to vote on absolutely everything, you know, to, to, to go through every last uh, subclause of a piece of legislation, vote on amendments, pro or uh, or calm. Um, so the question then is, how would you define those issues? Do you rely on the trigger? Well, you know, our experience with things like electronic petitions is that it can be quite easy to get lots of names without that necessarily implying that those people have felt very strongly about it. Um, so I, I, I don't, the, the answer is, at the risk of sounding muddled, it's, it's, I don't have a clear answer to this, but I think this is a subject that is going to be part of future political debate and not only in this country. On Ben's questions, um, the, the, the four years um, 
proposal remains part of the uh, negotiating position. And the PM set out um, his approach on welfare and migration at length in his speech in November 2014. And he will be speaking quite a bit about that subject again tomorrow in, in the speech he's giving tomorrow morning um, ahead of the letter to Donald Tusk. Um, I um, believe that uh, the Prime Minister will succeed in his objective of securing reforms that uh, he can campaign uh, enthusiastically for and, and uh, as part of a campaign to remain in the European Union and I look forward to supporting him in doing that. On your your question, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't share your, your view of George Osborne's speech. Um, I think the, the reality is that both the Conservative and the Labour parties for many years have had people within them who have been against British membership of the European Union. You know, both parties are, are broad churches. Um, I think that uh, some of the challenges that I described earlier on um, and the fact those have not been addressed sufficiently explain why um, people have, are perhaps more dissatisfied now than was the case a few years ago. Um, I don't agree with you about Germany um, I, because I think that you go to Germany and you look at how Germany confronts its own past and I think it's quite admirable the way in which they face up in modern Germany to the reality of what Nazism did with the support of many Germans and in the name of Germany as a nation. Um, and I, I think that um, if, you, if you look at how Germany has conducted its foreign and defense policies in the post-war period, you know, right up you know, to the present day, you can see that the uh, experience of 33 to 45 still weighs very heavily upon them. For Angela Merkel, you know, the decision to send arms to the Kurdish Peshmerga was a quite historic break with how Germany had previously been conducting foreign affairs and how they thought about the use of force, they've been seen to support the use of force. I also think, I'll be straight with you, I mean, I'm an admirer. I, I, I think that what Germany has done with the legacy of Nazism and then, but then to build a free society with embedded um, support for democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, and then to do that all over again for the Eastern Lender is, is a quite remarkable historical achievement. So, you know, I don't agree with German policy on absolutely everything in our national interest, though they often are aligned or not aligned on everything. Um, but I, I, I don't think that we should be, um, I don't think that we should be, be looking at the shadows of the past in dealing with Germany today. Okay, three more question there, one there, and one there. Thank you. Um, you mentioned two things, which kind of struck me as two kind of separate things. So one was the need to kind of hold a referendum to gain popular consent for the changes of the past 40 years in the European Union. The other one was the reform agenda, kind of making Europe fit for the 21st century, low change and so on. My question is, why tie these two uh, to each other? Because surely a, a reform agenda would be more believable without the threat of kind of withdrawal attached to it. And surely a referendum would be more believable if it was a kind of unconditional all-out question rather than something tied to some sort of concessions or techniques. Okay. I just had a, a, a sort of limited question about treaty change to follow up on, on the chair's question. Uh, so the British have been talking for some years about the prospect for treaty change, in fact, much more than any other member state, it seems to be. Uh, but it's not clear that there's much uh, appetite for it among other governments. So the, the British government might end up with some sort of promissory notes about future treaty change and what it would get. 
But does it have any sense in mind of when such a treaty change could take place? I think the third question was the first question, so we just take those two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why a referendum? Because the question mark over British membership is not going to go away. Um, you know, that, that is a reality in the British political debate. And I can remember, you know, the discussions with the Prime Minister before his Bloomberg speech in 2013. And the view he took, the government took, was that um, we were in a situation where simply trying to pretend that uh, the, the, this question did not exist was not going to work. And if, you, if you continued to refuse the uh, demands for referendum, then that was actually going to build up tension because what you had was not only dissatisfaction with various elements of how the EU operates today, but a profound sense that people were being denied their say in a very important decision about the future of their country. And that, that really did develop much more strongly after the Lisbon Treaty because people remembered that in the, 20, in the 2005 general election, all political parties had said, um, you can have a referendum on the constitutional treaty. When the constitutional treaty metamorphosed into the Lisbon Treaty, all of a sudden the then government decided that um, you know, a referendum was not needed after all. That did arouse a great deal of resentment. And what Cameron's decision did was to separate out the sense of resentment at not having a say from the arguments about the pros and cons of UK membership of the European Union. And he took the view that we, he needed to try to lead this debate, bring it to a head, and get a, get a decision on, on the basis of, um, of reforms that would be good for Europe, as, as, as well as making the British people feel more comfortable with their place in the, in the EU. On treaty change, I, mean, I, I, I don't think that um, we're anything like as isolated as you suggest. Um, when uh, Manuel Barroso was president of the European Union, he used one of his State of the Union speeches to the European Parliament to talk about the need for a revision of the treaties. Wolfgang Schäuble has been very open and consistent in saying that uh, the Eurozone needs to be uh, entrenched uh, upon the basis of revised treaties. The German Constitutional Court has said that you cannot take Eurozone integration and the mutualization of risk um, much further, if at all, uh, without either changing the treaties or rewriting German basic law. The German coalition agreement, when the, the current coalition was formed, actually has a clause within it that talks about um, being open to treaty changes uh, for, uh, in order to, to promote the stability of the single currency. So I think that the dynamic for integration is going to require treaty change at some stage in the next few years. I, I can't put a, a date on it at the, at the moment. Um, the, um, the, fiscal, the fiscal compact contains in it an article that says that the ambition is that the, the compact should be written in to the European Union treaties within five years. Now that's 2016, so that looks unlikely at the moment, but that ambition is there. And I think we would say, look, yeah, fine, we won't veto that if the safeguards that we've talked about, the integrity of a single market at 28, non-discrimination on grounds of currency, so on and so forth, are written in in a legally binding form at the same time. Um, so I think this question is going to have, is going to, have to come, so I, 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 and, and not very long into the future. Right. Are there any other questions? I'm very conscious of uh, the minister's time, so I'll take, or if we take really quickly those three, but can they be really short questions and short answers, maybe for you? Question. Um, to what extent do you think the EU referendum will settle the European question <laughs> in this country, and uh, both within your party and the population? That was admirably succinct. Um, we talked in earlier sessions about how the issues of immigration and the EU have been conflated in the public mind. And someone asked the question, how can we ensure that the referendum doesn't become a referendum on immigration? 
Final one, the final one there, just next to you, James. In 2009, the Prime Minister promised a, quote, complete opt-out from the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Is this still part of the government's renegotiation, and if not, why not? Um, taking those in reverse order, you'll have to have a look at the speech tomorrow morning um, for some further clues on, on, on that point. I'm not going to preempt what the Prime Minister says, um, but he will address that issue. Um, on um, immigration, um, it's, going to be, it's going to be a part of the debate. Um, because every opinion poll in the last six months is showing that uh, immigration is seen by the British public as the most important political issue at the moment. Um, I think the extent to which it dominates the referendum uh, debate will depend on, on, on what else is happening, what is achieved in the renegotiation, um, what other events are taking place, and how the, not just the government, but the two umbrella campaign groups conduct their uh, their campaigns. Um, will it settle things? In so far as in any democracy, anything can be said to be settled. You know, a, a democracy, by definition, always contains within its uh, institutional arrangements the possibility of altering course. But I think there is something decisive about uh, a public vote in a referendum of all adults. I think if you look at the AV referendum, and you know, that, is, that, that question is not um, you know, a live issue in British politics in the way that it had been in the years running up to, uh, to 2011. You look at EU membership, and you know, the 75 referendum did settle. The outcome, you know, the, the, the opponents of British membership reluctantly, but with good grace, accepted the democratic verdict. So I am you know, optimistic that the, the result will be, will be accepted. Okay, David, thank you ever so much for giving up your time. I know how busy it is for ministers to find an hour. Thank you also for answering the questions all so openly and fully, apart from for some reason refusing to brief on the Prime Minister's speech tomorrow. <laughs>